estimates that by 2050, the world population will increase to 9.7 billion people. Humans must drastically alter their food production to prevent the catastrophic effects of global warming. More than 820 million people worldwide go hungry every day. Innovating in this area will address massive global challenges. Warm welcome to all. Uh, my name is Alsbeta Klein, and I'm a director general of the International Fertilizer Association. My job is to make sure we can feed the world sustainably. We have in front of us a dilemma. Current global pandemic amplified already alarming situation. Over 800 million people suffer from chronic malnourishment and over 2 billion people suffer from micronutrient deficiencies. But that is not all. Food systems need to be transformed to better address nutrition and health, but also environment and climate change. Existing technologies need to be scaled up, innovations reinforced through financial markets and through partnerships. Is it a wishful thinking? What if the future of food were to tick all the boxes, offering healthy, nutritious food to all, making the best of arable land and urban locations, and be economically and environmentally sustainable? It is possible, and we will discuss ways to do it. Now that we have just seen the X-Prize introduction video, we will begin the discussion with His Royal Highness, Prince Khaled bin Anwalid, who is an advisor to the X-Prize Feed the Next Billion Challenge. So Prince Khaled, what is the X-Prize Feed the Next Billion Challenge about and what are you hoping to achieve? Uh, all right, Bismillah, um, Alhamdulillah, First of all, so thank you very much for having me amongst the esteemed panelists that, I'm, that are sitting in front of me, actually, virtually at least. Um, I'm really honored to be here. Uh, so the X Prize uh, Feed the uh, Next Billion is sponsored by Aspire, which is the Abu Dhabi Advanced Technology and Research Council, uh, Council the ATR, uh, ATRC. So one thing the ATRC does best um, is work towards uh, huge answers for the most pressing uh, global questions out there. And uh, hence the marriage between X Prize and, and the entity um, is just a marriage made in heaven, in my point of view. Uh, XPRIZE feed uh, the next billion um, uh, challenges teams to push the current limits um, uh, current limits of uh, alternative meat innovation while also focusing on uh, what's relatively been um, um, deprioritized, so to speak. So comparable nutrition value, uh, minimal environmental footprint, uh, no harm to animals, um, and, and obviously it's, um, uh, serves, uh, serving size and, and uh, versatility. One of the most interesting things is that the <clears throat> is that the focus will be on uh, on structured whole uh, chicken breast and the fish fillet uh, and and uh, we've seen numerous numerous uh, studies show that those are the most uh, two consumed uh, proteins in the world so focusing on those two proteins makes a whole lot of sense uh, the prize is open uh, to any form of solution in the following categories uh, plant-based uh, solutions cellular agriculture 3d printing fermenta fermentation as long as they uh, they are in in the guidelines of uh, the uh, the prize evaluation criteria that's great, pretty hard. So you're focusing on what really matters. You're focusing where most of the people consume, what most of the people consume in terms of protein, and you're focusing on those challenges. That's great. You're also a well-known investor in emerging technologies. So what would be great to hear is what are the changes that you're observing in terms of awareness around food tech companies, especially now during the global pandemic? 
And uh, is the public getting a uh, warmer perception and great, greater awareness around uh, food tech? And is it going to last? Uh, that's a beautiful question. So obviously we're going through um, uh, what, what is probably the most challenging uh, that, that we've gone through in the last uh, 20 years and in this uh, and this era. And um, in, in my point of view, it's the most important um, 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 uh, thing that has happened to us. Why? Because it's shifted people's uh, attention towards what priority, what, what are their priorities. Um, so from my point of view, I've seen a lot of um, a, lot, a lot a lot of coverage from the media for plant based alternatives. We've seen a, a, a slew of, of companies going into the cellular agriculture um, uh, ecosystem. We've seen retailers uh, putting uh, putting uh, allocating shelf uh, space uh, to 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 uh, the likes of. Uh, Beyond Meat and, and Impossible Foods um, and, and other obviously plant based um, alternatives. Um, more importantly, we've seen Singapore, and I hail Singapore for for the uh, for the enormous uh, uh, courage that it took uh, to uh, to start regulating um, uh, cellular agriculture. Um, and this didn't happen in co uh, coincidentally uh, during this pandemic. Uh, so um, we've seen all the issues that that, that the, <clears throat> this this current pandemic has um, has has driven towards, and it's opened people's eyes to the zoonotic diseases that are that are out there and um, and it's opened people's eyes to all the previous zoonotic diseases that that, that were uh, that were affecting people uh, so right now um, it is prime time for uh, for uh, companies uh, such as uh, cellular agriculture companies and and um, uh, plant-based protein as well as uh, farming companies to really show solutions <clears throat> to uh, food scarcity, to land scarcity, to uh, um, uh, to to all the issues that we faced during the lockdowns of of of, of having uh, having issues with food getting into rural areas. And now's the time to actually find solutions. That's amazing. I mean, this this current pandemic definitely has taught us a lot, and you're absolutely right about the the renewed focus on all the zoonotic diseases and everything around us, and just sort of rethinking how we do things. So, David, uh, welcome to this panel. Uh, you have been at the forefront of the technologies in food and technologies of tomorrow have been accelerating over the past couple of years. So perhaps this current pandemic made them go even faster, whether it be alternative protein that Prince Khaled talked about or vertical farming that you are in. These are still often seen as niche and they are definitely hard to scale. So I'd love if you were to share with us how to address the issue of scalability and reach. So how will companies such as yours and related companies scale up quickly and efficiently to have an impact? Yeah, and, and, and again, it's great to be here and a, an honor to join everyone. So scalability is enabled by a few different factors. Certainly technology, as technology advances and capital costs go down, operating costs go down, IRRs improve, then inherently businesses can flourish. The enabler of that for vertical farming, so at AeroFarms, we're a vertical farming company, at its, at its forefront is LEDs, light emitting diodes. And just independent of vertical farming, the cost structure of LEDs goes down, the efficiency goes up, and that enables the whole industry. There's a curve called the Heitz's curve, and it's analogous to Moore's law, which talks about the improvement of the efficiency of a diode every three years by 50%. So that's on a track. In addition, we innovate along that track. So it's not just about a diode going down, but understanding what spectrum, what intensity, what frequency different varieties use, optimizing that to lower the energy footprint. In addition, machine learning, machine vision and machine learning are tremendous for that. So as we understand how a plant works, and it's amazing, we have a very actual low understanding like human beings of what makes a plant work, whether it's good growth, bad growth, you sort of chuck it up to, well, it was nice weather or bad weather. But when you really control the environment and you could perform scientific experimentation, isolate a variable and test an assumption, one really unlocks a lot of unknown and allows for optimization of plant growth and therefore lowering costs. So that's one side, technology, and I could go on and on about how automation and all these features are reducing our CapEx and OpEx. The other side is human behavior. So human behavior, people are gaining awareness of harmful chemicals that are in our food. So pesticides, herbicides, fungicides, those are chemicals that are meant to kill things. We don't necessarily want them in our body. So if we could grow without these harmful chemicals, that's, that's advantageous. And then from a society standpoint, those chemicals might not be good for the soil. So in so much as these hard to calculate inputs are part of the calculus and commerce, 
then it changes behavior. So again, human behavior changing, technology behavior changing, that enables scale. There's a public policy relationship as well. We're debt. We need debt and, and low and cost of money to really help innovative companies, especially capital intensive innovative companies that are having massive societal impact to help fuel growth. So there are three legs of this stool, all three coming together, it gets us to move. That's why we're building a big facility in Abu Dhabi in the UAE, because there is a good public part, private partnership with Audio to build a big facility there. That's that's great, David. So a couple of things I'm actually taking from your uh, from your intervention. One, the interconnectedness between development and energy and development and food, uh, talking about LED and cost structure, et cetera, et cetera. And the other thing I'm taking out of your conversation that, that you haven't highlighted explicitly is that in your case, you can actually test hypotheses more than once a year because a normal farmer can test it once a year. The weather is good, the weather is bad. You can actually test it more than once a year and hopefully that speeds up and scales up your development. So we're going to move to Max. Max, you are inventing the future of milk. Um, I'd love if you can tell us a bit about Milk 3.0. Why is it important? Why is it relevant? Um, and if you can also tell us not only about scalability, but also about sustainability issue that you're trying to solve. Because if I get it right, you're actually solving both for access and for sustainability. Over to you, Max. Sure, sure. Thank you. Um, I, once again, uh, thanks for having having me on here as well. Uh, Milk 3.0 is really our efforts to be able to recreate the entire composition of milk, but without the animal. So it's a really an exciting um, a project that we've been doing for the last few years. Uh, we are based in Singapore, so this is a, a really wonderful place for us to be. Uh, of course, plant-based milks is something that we're huge proponents of as well. Uh, however, um, plant-based milks do lack the nutritional uh, components of, of, of milk. And, that, and that's really where uh, we step in. For us, uh, being able to make mammalian milk is, uh, is quite exciting. And, and of course, if you can make any type of milk, the most precious, most nutritionally uh, valuable milk for humans is actually human milk. So this is something that we've been working on and, um, and, and looking to go to market with. Um, so sustainability wise, it's a, of course, a very sustainable, cruelty free um, where we are when it comes to scalability. We're actually able to, to tap onto existing technologies that are that are currently out there for ups, upstream, downstream um, that, that are currently available. But one of the biggest areas that we've seen in, in this space is um, is the, the price of growth factors and the media. This is the stuff that helps the sales to grow. This is not just an issue with cell based milk but it's also issue with cell-based meats. It's a major problem. So one of the things that um, our CEO did very early on is start a program uh, internally to actually tackle this issue. We didn't just wanna wait for ex some external partners to come in and try to solve that for us. So uh, we have an amazing team and very recently we launched a project called, a company called Turtle Tree Scientific. And, uh, and we are actually able to bring the price point down to a fraction of what they have been in the past. So you'll be hearing a lot more of that. And actually, a lot of the cell-based meat companies are working closely with us as well as we're looking at uh, distributing this technology across the uh, ecosystem. Because we do believe this is going to be a reality very soon, the cell-based meats and cell-based foods. That's great, Max. This is this is a great introduction, and I have lots of questions for you. But we are going to move uh, to a slightly different topic, which is how do we get funding to actually do all of that? And I think David, you mentioned that we need debt, and both uh, Prince Khaled and um, Ellie Rubinstein are investors in this space. So Ellie, over to you. I think we can safely say that we have seen tremendous acceleration of investors' appetite for sustainability in their portfolios over the past few years. You are a growth investor in sustainable food. What are some of the factors that you evaluate when it comes to sustainability and impact of your potential investee companies? Well, first, thank you for having me. I love feeling like we're virtually together in Abu Dhabi. Um, that's a city that's very close to our heart. It's uh, the first international city I traveled to, and we have a, a large LP base there. So it's an honor to be with you all. Um, I'd like to take a step back and say, what does Manatree do? And as an investor, the first thing that we screen for is the healthfulness of the food. So we are trying to improve human health. And many people say, well, what about the environment or what about animal health? 
But I'll give you an example. If you look at our egg company or our beef company, we know that if you have a healthy egg going into your body, that that means that an animal must be on no antibiotics, eating a good feed, outdoors getting you know vitamin D, eating worms, eating grass. And so it's the supply chain of human health that we actually invest in. So inherently sustainability by the time it reaches a human is there. One of the things that Manatree has done an extremely good job of is figuring out how to make money in food. If you look over between 2012 and 2019, there's been over 1,200 startups in food. Now, Manatree for the last few years has been looking at about 300 of those per year. We look at about 30 in depth and we invest in less than 1%. But when we look at certain categories, we have to be able to tell our investors in 20 countries and 20 states in the U.S., who makes money? So I'll give you an example. Um, we heard from uh, David at Arrow Farms. We know that um, while we first started out with the largest pasture-raised egg company called Vital Farms, which there are many investors from the MENA region that were co-investors in it because it is a market share company. We have 85% market share in the U.S. of pasture-raised egg. Same thing with our beef company. But when we started looking at indoor farms, what we found is there was a resounding interest in this. I would arguably say more than what we saw on our plant-based space um, to date. But the difference is, is that we looked at 26 of these models in six countries. And what Manatree had to do is say, here who is profitable and how do we return capital to investors? And what we found is we invested in Gotham Greens. We announced it in August. Gotham Greens is located in five different states and has nine greenhouses. But the key thing is that they have a path to profitability within six months of breaking get ground on a greenhouse. So that means us as investors, yes, that's great. We love indoor farming because really what most people might not understand is there's no soil that goes into it. And a lot of the issues we're dealing with with poor health have to do with poor nutrients that are in the soil or some of the other stuff David talked about. I mean, you're getting rid of pesticides. But again, you can have great human health and a great product, but if there's not the financial metrics that match it, we won't touch it. And I think what we have tried to do is be the informed capital, as well as informing our investors overseas who are equally as in interested in investing in you know these types of companies in their region, what does it take to make, make money and make sense? Because I think what we're all really trying to not have happen as an industry is if you look back to 10 years ago where I started my investment career, kind of in the boom of green energy and you, know, you saw a lot of stuff in solar, but there were a lot of flops in venture capital. And I think what we are all trying to say is we, we personally at Manatree are growth investors. So while we say it might be a five to seven horizon, what was interestingly is we found it's actually more of a two to three exit horizon year if you can find the investment metrics that add up. And then last but certainly not least, you have to look at who your exit is. And that's a really interesting model today because you have to hit a certain, certain revenue and be profitable and have a culture and have a brand. So what Manatree I think has been has found is we love seeing startups for pattern recognition, but what we always try to say is what would be the solution? So where we're starting to look at is, you know, how do you invest in a co-packer? They are the ones that are actually going to allow, as David said, companies to scale because you can find a great, you know, snack startup and it might have what Manatree would want, which is it's using regenerative farming. It actually has a clean supply chain. It can trace them all back. But the reality is, is that cost comes to the consumer. And even though consumers might be willing as they are now to pay, you know, two thirds more of the price for a healthier product, there still has to be technology within the supply chain that allows that to scale. So that's a little bit of how we look at things from an investment firm. Thank you very much, Ellie. So one thing that you pointed out, which I'm going to pick up and go to Prince Khaled in a moment, is the uh, health of soils and nutrition in soil. And I think it's something that is often uh, not the, the priority topic for many because we are looking at the final outcomes rather than what actually starts the process. And I think it's something we need to think about. So Prince Khaled, over to you. Um, maybe Maybe expanding the conversation a little bit. So on one side, we are seeing consumers and their preferences for nutritious meals and fresh meals, et cetera, et cetera. And the pandemic has definitely changed that. But we are seeing worsening state of food security in many parts of the world for a variety of reasons, because of the pandemic, because of the supply chain. So the question that I have for you is how will these two trends accelerate development in food and agriculture? 
and what role will technology play not only to deal with sustainably produced foods uh, for uh, for people who who are aware and care about it, but how do we actually feed the world? Over to you, Prince Khaled. All right, so I, I love that question. And um, uh, from my point of view, um, look, innovation, uh, in my point of view, is, what, is what's going to solve the, what these world issues. We're looking at a 9.7 billion, uh, billion population by 2050. Uh, we're barely uh, able to uh, feed so many parts of the world. Ironically, because we can feed uh, 60 billion animals, but we can not feed 100, maybe six, 900 billion people. That's another subject. So we can definitely move to towards um, uh, towards investment. But again, I I, I want to echo um, what, what both my colleagues uh, said that it all it all revolves around how innovation uh, will, will will play uh, what kind of role would it play with, with the supply chain. And uh, more importantly, I think we need to touch upon this is regulation also. I mean, and a lot of this depends on how governments are going to perceive this and how governments are going to maybe ease off on the subsidies uh, from from other industries or even add some subsidies to other industries. Um, at the end of the day, um, uh, the future is definitely going to be solved through people like the panelists that we have in front of us, you know, people who have the money and the backing and the investors to it. But more importantly, also, it's a marriage made in heaven when you also have an entrepreneur who share that vision with you. And uh, that, that that's the vision we have. I mean, uh, Aero Farms, I love absolutely love what, what they do. We're an investor in, some, in a company that's similar to them, 1.1. Uh, uh, we're also investors in a company called Back to the Roots, which is um, basically a package. Uh, um, uh, um, um, uh, let me see, um, uh, organic seeds, basically, that you ship to people, and they can and they can um, um, uh, grow in house. These are these aren't going to solve world issue uh, problems. They're not going to solve world hunger for 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 crying out loud. But at the end of the day, collectively, we're, that's the only real way we're going to be able to do something like this. Thank you, Prince Khaled. So really, it is about innovation, but it's also about the policy enabling environment. So we've got two entrepreneurs in front of us on the panel. I'm sure you're dealing with government regulators day in, day out. They can help you. Sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. So David, any recommendations uh, for policymakers when it comes to your business? Yeah, it's uh, understand what you're good at and what you're not good at. So often, um, policymakers like to be prescriptive, meaning choosing winners and losers, where they should actually focus on performance. So understand what are the key behaviors they want to influence, and then what are the ways to influence those behaviors. So, for example, if you want less pollution, raise the standard of air quality or raise the standard of water quality, and then the changes really move through commerce. So uh, you see it in agriculture where in, in Salinas, for example, there's river runoff of excess fertilizers or excess uh, pesticides, herbicides. It goes into rivers. There are algae blooms, dead zones, bad. So if you tax pesticides to a certain degree, then farmers, where pesticides, for example, get so cheap, farmers just put it on in abundance much more than they need to, but then they're more aware of the economic trade-offs that otherwise aren't in the calculus, and then they're, they farm smarter. The same thing with water. We have this belief that water is free. Maybe when it comes down from the sky, it's free, but once you have to move it, there's a real cost. So if we, if we subsidize water, you're almost hurting the entrepreneurs from solving that problem. But if you keep that problem in commerce and even put market rates on water, then if Aero Farms, for example, if we invest in in dehumidification and closed loop systems to put water in farming. If we invest in filtration to take algae out and keep water in closed loop solutions and use a lot less water, then there's a benefit for being a good actor. Right now, we there are a lot of unintended consequences where people are trying to subsidize things with that monkey up commerce and the ability to solve problems. And also people try and be prescriptive. Again, be performance-based, raise performance, let the innovators innovate and solve problems. So what I'm hearing from you, David, is really focus on outcomes rather than inputs when it comes to subsidies. And what I'm also hearing uh, is the 
need for those who are farming to understand the full economic cycle and uh, be able to, to, to basically rationalize along that cycle rather than being forced by particular regulatory environment in various points in their, in their growth cycle, right? Uh, essentially. essentially. Max, uh, over to you. How do you scale up your technology and make sure that it comes at a price accessible point to the market? And again, what is your recommendation to regulators when it comes to bringing sustainability onto our plates? Great. I think when it comes to scalability, we're looking at off-the-shelf technology uh, and bioprocessing systems that we can use today to start uh, actually producing uh, the milk that we're talking about. Uh, the high-value human milk is really how we can get hit profitability. One of the things that uh, resonates with myself, um, I, I've been in business for many, many years, uh, and uh, as Manitri had mentioned, you have to have a revenue generating company if you're going to be sustainable as well. So really the model that we looked at is although we can make this really cool uh, product, how can we build a high value product that can be revenue generating very early on? And for us, that's going to be all these high value human milk components uh, that can play anything from infant nutrition to senior care. There's a lot of different uh, things that are in human milk. Uh, that are quite valuable. So that's how we really hit the ground running this, this coming year. Um, but when it comes to the regulatory side, I think we're in a very fortunate um, country. I mean, I'm from California, but I've never seen anything like S Singapore. I've been here for the last few years. And uh, the, the Singapore Food Agency works very closely with startups around here. Uh, we meet with them on a very regular basis. They, they ask questions like, how is your? Uh, how can we work together to get your product to the market? And that's not what we're, what I'm used to hearing uh, in the U.S. Uh, and of course, um, the the level of involvement is quite extensive as well because they're really looking at how they can help you with safety, uh, toxicology, and a number of other things to be able to help you get your product um, out there. So I think if there was any recommendations, it would be just work much closer to your uh, startups that are in this space and understand this is a different space uh, than many other startups because these type of companies are trying to solve the much bigger problems around climate change uh, as, as well as a, a number of other things that, that, that have been highlighted. So that's what I can say about the regulatory folks out there uh, who are listening. Um, but for us, I think we're pretty well positioned this year um, when it comes to product uh, to just roll out with high value human milk stuff. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Max. I'm hearing sort of support for startups uh, broadly defined. I'm going to call on Prince Khaled. So obviously you are supporting a lot of startups and you're investing in startups as well. Anything you want to add to what David and Max mentioned about regulatory, regulatory environment and supportive environment for companies that you are investing in? Um, I mean, um, there's nothing much I can add, you know, they, they really hit the nail on the head. As long as you're in an environment, uh, a nourishing environment from a regulatory standpoint, as well as from an investor standpoint, um, and granted, this, uh, an investor standpoint is a lot easier because it's a little more, it's, it's because it's global. Uh, but as long as you have regulatory backing, it's a lot easier. I mean, honestly, um, the, the, the thing that uh, that's just struck me with with Singapore is that this is a breakthrough when it when it comes to um, regulatory approvals. Uh, so I'm I'm really hopeful to see the U.S. Uh, hopefully the Middle East uh, uh, follow suit. Great, thank you. So, Ellie, over to you. Uh, if you have anything to add on the regulatory environment, because you are seeing companies, and then I have another question for you. Sure. And I, yeah, first let me address the regulatory, and then I'd like to come back to um, another thought. So, one thing you guys not, might not be aware of is there's basically two ways that you can invest in food right now. You have the food tech, which I think our panelists do a great job of representing, and then you would have what I would call more on the, the food health, and that's pharma merging with food. That's an area where our firm has actually moved into the direction of, we've been trying to do it, but it's the trick has been regulatory. We finally found a deal that made sense. We'll be announcing it in a week. Um, and what I mean by that is, how do you actually find a regulation where you can do food as medicine? So what it turns out we were able to do was partner with the leading health science firm who I cannot disclose yet um, and they are the leaders and this is in the baby gut microbiome space so you're talking about the most vulnerable um, position from a baby as well as a mother right are you really going to put something in a baby from the NICU where it's currently standard of care 
all the way through age one. Now, as somebody who has personally had lifelong stomach issues, because I did have a mother that was on antibiotics, um, what it turns out is 90% of babies born via C-section or mothers are on antibiotic do not have something called the B. infantis strain in their gut, which means that can be in colic, that can be an IBS. And so most people, we have three newborns in our firm. My sister is a young kid. A lot of my friends have had newborn babies. Their babies are crying. They can't digest. Now, the reason it is, is it's not just the problem of the mother. I mean, these are, you know, most moms today, when they're pregnant, they're going to be very careful of what they eat. It's what's in the environment. And so again, goes back to soil health. You know, you could be eating a healthy kale salad or rice, but you don't know that maybe there's arson in the nutrient. So to actually be able to have not only a breakthrough, but the key thing is we don't classify this investment as venture. And I'll tell you why. It's very interesting. This investment is a powder. So this powder is added to breast milk. It is not a pill. If it had been a pill, it would have been on a different regulatory and you would have to go through FDA approval, which people know in the US is extremely slow. This actually is a consumer product where you add the powder to your milk, it comes in a pretty box and you can buy it on Amazon today. So they already have sales. So it's not a traditional biotech where you work 10 years to try to get something approved and then you get sales. So from an investor standpoint, it's been de risk but again, the science is there. You know, you're talking about the microbiome. So where we are extremely excited as investors, and I think, you know, there, there needs to be some hope in the world. We have a new administration coming into the U.S. that's pro-science. We see that. And um, I think that what we're really wanting, you know, people to see is food is medicine. You can absolutely use some of the innovations we're talking about here. And, and I would just say, don't discredit this current administration. I mean, they're willing to do things like look at agriculture. And the other key thing I would point out on the regulatory framework, we, we shouldn't be so mean on big food and agriculture and subsidies because 50 years ago, Food science was created for food safety, okay? That's exactly why it was created. But food science was not created for food health. So I actually once talked to the guy that invented GMOs for a large you know, ag company. And again, they were just trying to be able to feed the world in mass production. But we didn't know that it would cause cancer or cause obesity. But now that it is actually in the US, for example, you know, obesity, believe it or not, the cost of obesity is more than 9% of GDP. And, you know, 70% of leading deaths in the U.S. are due to lifestyle, which actually have to do with poor diet. So I don't need to tell you all this. I would say I feel a very strong connection to it. You know, my father's also in the private equity industry. And, you know, what some of the earliest thing he did was scale innovation over to the Middle East, such as the largest Domino's or the largest Pizza Hut. And I've always personally felt bad because, you know, are we contributing to the obesity rates over in the Middle East of what they're eating? But the reality is, is that those companies have scalability. And what the startups need to do is one, not trash big food because they have the able, the ability to be able to, you know, get this out into the masses much more quickly. So I would really encourage startups to go to these guys. And also these guys are the ones that are probably going to be buying up your company. They're not trying to harm people. They want to feed people healthier. And so that's kind of the global perspective and from a regulatory standpoint i'm encouraged i think that we as an investment firm which you'll hear more about have started our own research foundation which is actually going to allow people to use this food compass that we worked with research universities to produce because what we've said is yes we're an investment firm but if we do not give this knowledge and give this index of scaling companies from one to a hundred we're not actually contributing to the industry. And this is a, a something that we all need to work together. So the only way we can do that is by scaling innovation, knowledge, and research. And so- and this is why we started with scaling up from max- But, but the point I wanna make scale about scalability is we're always you know, looked at is, okay, can we bring this company to the Middle East today? Can our beef company you know, help with food security? And what I would say is it's not necessarily about getting food into the hands of the country. What is totally missing is knowledge and innovation. For example, it's, in the UAE, there's no PhD in food science, not that one is program. Incredible. So that how is do you incredible. expect the startups over there to actually know how to be able to create the food of the future. And so that's what I would say is the reason we like working with our Middle East investors, they come to us all the time. We have a that's, mushroom deal. It might be different than the one you invested yeah. in, but can you help us look at it? We have a farming deal on indoor you know, fish. Can you look at that it? That is perfect. And that so is the research, it just the research part we're trying to scale is let's take our scholar model 
and give this to you so that the next generation is food scientists and food health. That's perfect. So this is this is great. So I'm going to give last 20 seconds to print Khaled a key message for investors who are coming to this space and key message for investors who are coming to the Middle East. Give us 20 second take on what that should look like. Prince Khaled. Oh, that's the simplest 20 seconds of my life. Listen to Gabrielle. That's that's all I have to say. She's she's 100 percent on point and everything that she was talking about. Food science is definitely something that's missing here. We've voiced it a bunch of times and, and we're working actually with the UAE government to, to establish some sort of ecosystem to develop that. That is great. Prince Khaled, thank you very much. That was a great closure. I would like to thank to this esteemed panel, Max, David, Ellie, Prince Khaled. Thank you for joining me here. Uh, I think we solved a few questions about the future of food, new taste, new priorities and new technologies. Thank you and I look forward to working with all of you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Thanks.